And it's week three of Synod Central, where we're bringing you the latest from the month-long Synod on Synodality in Rome. Joining me is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, from Rome, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray, joining me in Manhattan. Gents, we're more than halfway through this. Thanks for being here. Uh, I want to start with comments made by Cardinal Gerhard Mueller this week. Now, he rejoined the Synod after missing the start of the event due to illness. He renewed his criticism of this gathering, saying it is not a Synod of bishops due to the presence of lay voters. He also warned against the creation of what he calls a post-Catholic church. Quote, we cannot follow the example of the ancient Gnostics who wanted to transfer the church to a higher stage of its historical existence and disguise this betrayal with the beautiful label of a synodal church. Father, he also cautioned against the church becoming Christianity without dogma, sacraments, and apostolic magisterium. Your thoughts on those observations? Cardinal Miller is absolutely right. What we're facing here is something unprecedented in the history of the church. Uh, we discussed this a year ago, uh, Raymond, when we were talking about the changes in this composition of the synod. A synod of bishops is precisely that, of bishops. When you bring lay people, priests, deacons, women and men religious, all together, it ceases to be a synod. Now, the pope has decided that this is what he wants. He wants this kind of meeting. But it is different than the Synod of Bishops as established at the Second Vatican, as it, first at the Second Vatican Council, but then put into effect by Pope Paul VI. So uh, Vatican II called for a meeting of bishops, and now we get a meeting of everybody. So that's wrong. That's not what we need because the bishops are govern the church. They have the sacramental charism of governing the church. Governance, teaching, sacramental ministry, they all go together. This gives the false impression that lay people have an equal say in the governance of the church, and that theory has been going around a lot. In fact, Cardinal Muller is very quite aware of this. People have this notion that if you're baptized, you get to be ruling in the church if you're picked for that. That's not how it works. Those who are chosen yeah. to be apostles, the successor of the apostles, they govern the church. Uh, Bob, Cardinal Muller has been making these observations for a good long time, really since last year's synod. Is anyone in Rome listening? Has it changed at all what's happening here? Well, I don't think so. I don't think he's had any effect, whatever. And it's unfortunate that he was ill at the beginning because maybe he could have in introduced something early on. What I'm hearing, especially the last few days, is something a little bit different, by the way, that um, Father is exactly right. that they, Not only is, is, is this not a sin, it kind of gives the impression, even though they keep denying it, that this is a democracy. The, the Pope himself says this is not a democracy, it's a consultation. But that's the impression that people take away. And, and often impressions are really the, the message that comes across. What's been talked about explicitly in the last few days in particular is raising up the authority of bishops' conferences and even continental um, you know, uh, organizations of bishops in, in, in many ways. Now, I don't know that this is going to succeed, but I get the impression that this is a way to kind of move off of the, the controversies at the Senate itself and then kind of delegate the further radicalism to uh, very, various bishops' groups. And when I started to see this, I looked up uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was head of the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, actually in the famous Ratzinger report, wrote against bishops' conferences. He says they are not yeah. instituted by Christ. Bishops are instituted by Christ. That, there are, that national conferences are nowhere in our tradition. You don't have national conferences. There weren't even nations in many respects when, as the, the bishop's um, uh, role was being developed. Right. So there's, there are two things going on here. On the one hand, we've got this kind of democratic assembly. And on the other, I, I think it's worth keeping a close eye on what's going to happen over the next week and a half or so, because there, there's some reason that they're emphasizing these bishops' conferences and they're trying to give them a status that maybe won't go as far as the Germans are, have gone in their radicalness, mm. but would portend for the future, we can't really say what. Yeah, well, well Father, it, it, it sounds like the sin at home edition. You know, Cardinal Muller also raised the incompatibility of a Protestant understanding of synodality. 
uh, as opposed to the true concept of synodality in the Catholic sense, he cites Anglicanism as a middle way between Protestant and Catholic understandings, and that that's been a failure. Now several non-Catholic delegates spoke at a recent press conference briefing at the Vatican, celebrating the new revived ecumenism being fostered by this synod. Father, if the understanding of the synod is flawed, as Cardinal Muller seems to suggest, can true ecumenism be happening at the gathering? And your reaction to what Bob shared about the bishops' conference becoming the, uh, the local synod in perpetuity, I guess. Yeah, well, I'll start with that question. Yeah, this absolutely Cardinal Ratzinger uh, wrote against this uh, decades ago precisely because there was a movement to try and turn national bishops conferences from the basically organizational structures that they are to organize the apostolate in different countries into sources of doctrinal authority so that a bishops conference could issue a document on its own authority and teach something new or, or make some precisions whatever this is artificial and has nothing to do with catholic teaching the only areas in, that bishops use for teaching together is a general council uh, and then we have particular councils which have a certain teaching authority, but it, that's a technical question. It's certainly not what the bishops' conference idea that they're putting forward in Rome. It does give that impression. And I, let's tie this in with fiducia supplicans. Remember when the African mm -hmm. bishops came forward and said, we're not going to implement it, and the Pope told them you don't have to? This is not right. how the Catholic Church works. But I could see this happening. The bishops' conference in Germany says, not only when fiducia supplicans, we're going to extend it to all, all people in other ways, you know, have transgender blessings and all this stuff. The Africans won't have it. Chaotic. Uh, now, the, the other questions, of course, there, there's so many different difficult things to talk about in the Synod, because since the Pope organized it, we would have to say, well, the Pope knows what he's doing. But I would say what he's doing is in contradiction to what all of his predecessors did. You do not put bishops in a room and say, we're, we're going to take a vote. And lay people have an equal role to the bishops in advising the Pope on how to govern the church. That's not, it's true that what that becomes is a consultation. It's not a synod. A synod is a solemn yeah. meeting in which bishops who exercise authority work together with the Pope. This has become a free for all mm -hmm. and it portends dangerous developments, I'm afraid. Well, Bob, there are plenty of non Catholic delegates and consultants here as well. Now, I know they were present at Vatican II, but this seems to be a very, this is a do it yourself. It almost feels like it's ad hoc and it's being created in real time. Yeah, one of the things that Cardinal Ratzinger said back in the 1980s was um, that these bishops' conferences, and, and they were starting to get to be influential back then, that they tend to dilute the authority of a bishop himself. And the bishop is really designated by the church to be the teacher in a local area. And he gave it as an example what happened under Nazism. He said, you know, the bishops' conference tended to be, have these weak as water statements because they you know they didn't want to anger anybody and they 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 wanted to reach some kind of consensus that everybody could sign off with whereas there were the the real voices that spoke out against nazism and and affirmed the, the catholic teaching about human beings and their, their dignity and whatnot with the individual bishops so the danger here is is not only that this is going to be a, a kind of a perpetual synod that is going to be in, implemented via national bishops conferences, but bishops themselves are going to feel somewhat, um, I think, undermined if the focus is on, say, the USCCB rather than what a bishop does in his own uh, diocese. And that, this really changes the, the, the dynamism and who knows where that would lead. This would really, we don't have to have a, it's like having a constitutional convention to decide, you know, how this how are the states going to uh, interact with the federal government? It's a very complex subject that I think is being dealt with in a very superficial way. Mm. Gents, the subject of a so-called female diaconate and ordination of women seems to continue to jump from the periphery of these study groups where the Pope had relegated them, I think to keep them off stage during this synod, to center stage. At the beginning of the synod, members voted to devote an entire afternoon on October 18th to dialogue with the leaders of these various study groups tasked with discussions of female diaconate, LGBT issues, among other things. They are also taking email submissions until next June from synod officials and any Catholic who wishes to share their perspectives on these issues. Uh, Bob, what do you expect to see from these dialogues scheduled on Friday? Is this just a getting to know you session or do you see anything real coming from this? 
Uh, maybe I've gotten too cynical, and I have been here a lot of weeks. And let me tell you, the, the other the, the other theme I keep hearing from people who are participants is that they are just going up the wall with boredom. Um, you know, there's this link, link uh, this language that gets, keeps getting repeated. I was listening to one of the press conferences uh, just recently, and, and, you know, I've studied several languages. I don't speak German, for example, that well, but I noticed that even in German, it's easy to understand because the German terms are the same terms that they're using in all the other languages. I, I think that this is, it, it's a way of kind of keeping people on side. They, oh, yeah, we're going to be talking about these hard issues of women, deacons, and and LGBT and whatnot, but the Holy Father is actually pronounced against these things already. And so yeah. to me, I think that this is just a way to kind of um, tamp down some of the the um, more radical elements in the, in the, in the larger group. Um, it may lead to something else. I don't think it will. It, it's typical of, of Pope yeah. Francis that he kind of holds out the, the football and then pulls it away at the, at the, at the last moment. But the, the, uh, this ongoing discussion just kind of keeps giving people the impression that there's almost nothing that might not be redefined further down the road. And in fact, right. one of the theologians at a recent press conference said to somebody who asked him, what are we going to say to people when they don't get an answer? They've asked, you know, LGBT people have, have asked for an answer. And they don't get it. And he says, well, you know, the Synod doesn't end at the end of the Synod. It'll go on. And maybe some point in the future yeah. we'll have an answer. Yeah. No, it goes on and on. Father, it seems they're creating this endless bureaucracy and, and, and formalized discussion over issues that are already settled matters. I mean, there was even a nun at a press conference who was agitating for female ordination. And as we said last week, everyone in the room, all the participants are gagged. They are not allowed to speak except for these few who are chosen, as you underscored in our conversation last week. So who's featuring this? Why is this continually pushed on the international church? Well, I can only guess uh, that this is a strategy that the Holy See has adopted, which is we say no on the one hand, but then we put forward people who will not accept that, and they say, yes, we need female ordination, and they use the platform of the Holy See press conference to say it, and then the Holy mm -hmm. See doesn't issue a correction afterwards saying, well, we already said no to that. Um, this is part of the mysterious way that this pontificate has decided to govern the church, which is that people who say things which contradict Catholic truth are told to occasionally stop it. But in general, they keep doing it and they keep getting invited. You know, the perfect example mm -hmm. we talked about last week, Cardinal Ratcliffe, Cardinal elect Ratcliffe. He contradicts Catholic teaching on the, on the homosexuality. Yeah, and look, as an example of what we're talking about here, Brazilian Cardinal and Synod member Leonardo Steiner first made headlines on October 12th, again, at a press conference. Uh, he, he said this one in Portugal, then he repeated it at a Vatican press conference, and he announced he's already celebrating a paraliturgical ordination of women, if you will. He said he lays hands on the individual women who is going to, quote, celebrate a sacrament, end quote, like baptism or a wedding. According to Steiner, quote, in our reality, women exercise the deacon's ministries. The vast majority are coordinated by women. The role of women in the church of the Amazon is fundamental. And regarding the laying on of hands, he said, when I send someone, for example, to baptize, I lay hands on them, but I don't lay hands on someone as an ordination. I lay hands as the apostles did, a sign of receiving a ministry and that this person will celebrate a sacrament, end quote. Father, are the duties he's talking about always typical of the role of a deacon? And what impression does this give to the 1.6 million Catholics under his care, not to mention the Catholics watching it around the world? Sure. Well, he's, he's given the impression that he's simulating a sacrament, meaning that he's going through the motions of something that cannot happen. You know, you cannot ordain a woman, a deacon, priest, or bishop. It's impossible. But he goes through the motions of putting her, his hands on her head in view of what she's going to do later at his request, uh, go to a distant area and do uh, baptisms and the like. Well, this is reprehensible. He should not do this. I hope he got up before he did and said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to make clear this is not an ordination. It's not an ordination. <laughs> and then people might say, okay, well, then why are you using the ritual of an ordination, which is the playing on of hands, if it's not an ordination? No, I say this is a strategy of subversives. 
you know, they assert that they already are, have the power to do what they want, stop me. And then he brags about it afterwards. No, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is creating the impression that bishops in the Catholic Church can contradict the doctrine and practice of the universal church and get away with it. I have heard no Roman correction yet on this. Uh, we no. need that. This no. is wrong because people are going to go ahead and do it. Uh, other imitating. Well, and some of them are going to say, well, I do believe it's an ordination. Yeah, well, Bob, this is the problem. Look, they, they're saying in our experience, as if it, their personal experience somehow trumps the eternal teachings and doctrines of Jesus Christ and his church. I mean, what happens here is the practice becomes the doctrine from altar girls to this. This guy also supports, by the way, a married priesthood. How dangerous is this freelancing, Bob, and advertising it for the Vatican to allow the advertising of this kind of, let's say it, heresy on an international forum like this? Yeah, I agree with Father entirely. This gives the impression of, of, of a sacrament. And look, we saw it actually with the blessing of gay couples, and let's say it is gay couples, not individuals in, in these relationships, that immediately start to take on the form almost of a, of a kind of a para uh, marriage uh, 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 sacrament. And, you know, the thing about this in particular is I don't even think that that move, as dangerous as it is, is going to satisfy anybody who's a radical. Because it's not the functions that these people want. I mean, you could have some kind of, I don't know, category that's not a, 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 an ordination of women who are doing certain things. And we have, we have religious um, sisters in, in orders and, you know, in all sorts of ways they, they, they serve the church. They don't want the function. They want the power. They want the, they want the status. And that's, that is the thing that has been denied theologically over and over again. I mean, this bishop said he's, we have to recover something that that existed in the past, and it didn't. It's been studied over and over and over again. Yes, of course, there were women in the early church who performed uh, important functions for the early church, but they were not ordained as as uh, ordained deacons are, which is a, a, one of the steps towards toward being a priest. So for him to do it to do this, He's confusing things in, in a way that he must know what he's doing and he knows where it might lead to. I, you know, he's the, the he's the Bishop of Manaus, which is in a very interesting place. It, it's out in the middle of the Amazon, but they also have an opera house because at one point they were so wealthy that they built an, an opera house and, and uh, Caruso sang there one time. And, and a Brazilian friend of mine once told me the alligators could actually hear the opera being sung there. So it's a, it's a strange place. And what he's done is itself a confusing, strange thing that, let, let us hope, is not reproduced elsewhere. Yeah, this Cardinal Steiner also weighed in on fiducia supplicans, which permits the blessing of same-sex couples. Uh, he said this, we bless water, we bless cars, we can't bless a person who's openly homosexual. Father, he goes on to attribute resistance to fiducia to those who want to go back to a pre-Vatican II church that will never return. Your thoughts on this, and I'll throw this in. You also had Timothy Ratcliffe, the soon-to-be cardinal, who suggested the African church's opposition to this was only because of money from evangelicals and the Russian Orthodox. That's what fueled it. Your, your shot. Yeah, I mean, this kind of uh, condescending uh, analysis of the African church by European liberals who basically are saying, um, no, you know, if it weren't for the money coming from the U.S. and Russia, and if it weren't for the criticisms they get from their Muslim confreres, they'd all be in agreement with us. This is a dream world and ridiculous notion. It's absolutely false. The African bishops believe in the Bible, they believe in the, nor in the moral law, the natural law. Homosexual acts are immoral because they violate the created order and they violate the express commandments of God as read both in the Old and New Testaments. Now, Bishop Steiner, by you know, talking as he does in the way that he does, he, he gives the impression that Catholic doctrine uh, started at Vatican II uh, and that everything else before it is illegitimate. You know, whatever happened to that great movement that we had to get back to the life in the early church to interpret, you know, how things should go in the life of the church? Uh, we should go back to the early church, read the scriptures, read the fathers of the church. There are no women deacons. There are no homosexual couples being blessed. Uh, we're, basically, we're in a willful situation where men with power 
betray their oath as bishops and undermine the faith. They're supposed to defend the faith, not dismantle it. Uh, gentlemen, Pope Francis received, and again, this is the only thing we're, we're really allowed to cover, and I'll just share this with you as a journalist, and Bob, you can reflect on this in a second. We don't have access to the room itself, this synod, this great listening moment for the whole church. The only people allowed to listen to it are the invited participants, those hand-selected by the Pope and those around him. We only get press conferences and the occasional uh, shots of private meetings that are happening on the edge of this. Now that takes us to this story. The Pope met with another group of trans persons for a nine-minute meeting on October 12th. The meeting was organized by Sister Janine Gramick. She's the founder of New Ways Ministries, and just for context, Cardinal Ratzinger, back in 1999, prohibited Gramick from working with gay people because of, quote, errors and ambiguities in her approach. Following the meeting, Sister Janine said Pope Francis was willing to, quote, listen to the experiences of intersex and transgender people. She went on to say that she thinks these stories will help the church, quote, break out of old, ill-informed teachings and practices, end quote. Bob, there apparently was a surgeon present at this meeting with the Pope who advocated sex change operations for those who are intersex and trans. What message do this, does this send? And why would the Pope meet so freely with these individuals and not others in the church? That, that surgeon actually has done uh, sex, train, uh, uh, sex change surgeries. So he's he's one of the butchers that, that we, uh, we, we we read about. Look, there's you know among the many contradictions and, and confusions that we we've talked about over now years. Consider this: the uh, New Ways Ministry is very radical. It's, it's even more radical than Father James Martin because they're they're open about what they want. I think Father Martin kind of plays the the, the margins. And New Ways Ministries was condemned by our bishops' conference. So if on the one hand you're trying to affirm the fact that bishops conferences should have some kind of authority over a certain territory, and then on the other hand you have an, an instance in which the bishops who know that country extremely well, much better than anybody in the Vatican is going to know it, have rejected what these people have been doing for decades, what does that tell you? It, it tells you that the people who are, are doing these things are making it up as it goes along. And I, and I think that the one thing that that it is so utterly striking is the Holy Father meets with these people right in the midst of the synod, which took that issue off the table. So is he sending out a message to them? You know, I, I'm sure he thinks yeah. he's, he, I may have said this before on the show, but I, I, I think it bears repeating. I'm sure he thinks he's meeting with the tax collectors and prostitutes. But he sits there and he smiles and then they came out and not only did they say that it, it made a difference, they seem to have the impression that he had said that he would be open to appointing bishops who were more welcoming of LGBT. Very confused, multiple messages that, that I think are only going to continue to do harm because not only are they bad in themselves, but they contradict one another. Father, that, that surgeon that Bob and I mentioned a moment ago, he described Francis as very, or she described Francis as very receptive to her message and the message of the group. Which brings me to this, New Ways Ministry is really controlling the message here. They're doing the teaching. While the Vatican offers no clarification, no correction, no official release on what happened there, and the gags of the actual bishops at the meeting continue. Your reaction? Yeah, this is so disappointing to say the least. It's really infuriating that a woman, this nun, who criticizes Catholic teaching as being outmoded and outdated, is given the privilege of seeing the Pope. This isn't the first time. She also got a congratulatory letter from the Pope. She is an enemy of the Catholic faith. We have to say it quite clearly. She was corrected decades ago. She refuses to take the correction. Receiving her gives the impression that it's okay to deny the faith because you have access to the Pope and then you can leave a meeting, characterize the meeting, and then not be contradicted. Uh, this is really terrible. It's not good for her soul, the souls of the people that she's influencing. And really, what did the Catholic faithful look to the Holy See for? Confirm the brethren in the faith. How do you confirm brethren in the faith when you take people who are radical deniers, not only of revelation and the natural law, but uh, of the very human existence made by God? God created us male and female. These people say, no, that's up to you to decide. This is terrible. It really is bad. And I can't help but say, as we've said over the years, 
When a group of Latin mass Catholics get similar courtesy and are allowed to spend time with the Pope and tell of their anguish and then walk out and say the Pope is on our side, then I'll be saying, well, at least there's some fairness in who gets to see the Pope. Mm. Gents, last week we reported on the announcement of that December consistory that will elevate 21 new cardinals into the College of Cardinals. This week, Vaticanista Louis Badia, a Chilean journalist, had some interesting observations about the statement that I want to get your reactions to. Specifically, he asked how much synodality goes into the selection of these new cardinals the notion of internationalization and peripheries, which the Vatican mentions regarding the church of the 21 new red hats, is, quote, vague and arbitrary. He says, and many of these men preside over minuscule Catholic populations in their dioceses. Father, uh, Badia also says the 163 cardinals created so far by Francis seem to be carbon copies of him, at least in their thinking. How is that synodality? Well, there's no synodality, obviously, on this because the Pope, unless it's all private and we don't know about it, uh, he doesn't consult uh, widely, you know, with totos, with everybody about who should become a cardinal. In fact, he announced his criteria years ago that he wanted to take people from the peripheries, which undermines the historical institution of the College of Cardinals. The College of Cardinals originally was meant just for Roman clergy, then it expanded to major dioceses and important uh, places uh, in the Catholic world so as, so as to gain the knowledge, wisdom, and experience of the bishops of large flocks. Now, for instance, the Bishop of Tehran, you know, I have more people in my parish than he has Catholics in the entire country. Uh, why is he being chosen to be a cardinal? No one knows him. I, I hope, and I'm, you know, I'll say this, I, God bless him and I'm not criticizing him. He didn't make this choice. But why is it the, mm -hmm. the Archbishop of Los Angeles uh, is not a cardinal, whereas the Bishop of Algiers and the Bishop of Tehran is? This makes no sense. And then the Pope nominated his, uh, the priest who does his travel arrangements and made him a cardinal, his priest from India. No criticism of him, but that's not how the system's supposed to work. This isn't a prize to be given to people who have access to your office and get to talk to you on a frequent basis. This should be reflecting the universality of the church, and that's missing here. Yeah, Badia calls them, the, the Chilean journalist, he calls them copy-paste cardinals, Bob. Can there be dialogue when everyone agrees in lock, lockstep or at least has the same mindset? I'll give you the last word quickly. Yeah, I don't think that that's actually quite right. For example, the Ukrainian Catholic um, bishop who was, uh, it will be raised to be a, a cardinal. I've heard privately that when the, the Australian bishops met with the Pope, he was the most outspoken in criticizing the way that the, the, uh, the, the Pope has been handling uh, abuse cases and some other issues as well. But somehow he took a shine to this younger guy. He passed by Anthony Fisher, the, the Archbishop of Sydney, who's a terrific guy. Um, and he, of course, uh, Shevchuk the, uh, the, in uh, Ukraine has not been, been made a cardinal. So um, there, there is a little static in this. And I think it has something to do with the chaotic way that we remember a few years ago, the Pope decided that the, some bishop in Mongolia was going to become a cardinal. And, and there's a, yeah. a, a bishop in Tonga that became a cardinal. It, it isn't right. that kind of prudent uh, kind of um, calm weighing of what, you know, what, what are we doing here? There's just kind of a... You know, this, the, he gets enthusiastic about somebody. I think Badia is about right for about half of the people. The other half we'll have to see. Okay, gentlemen, we will leave it there. Thank you both for commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray. Visit thecatholicthing.org and tune in October 24th for our next Synod Central update. Thank you, gents.